these boots are old. There's the old the heels are gone, see? I had the heels cut down when I got older because I didn't like the big high heel on the back. Uh, but it is good to be here. I like walking on. No, I won't say that. Uh, you know, I usually start with a little funny. So I have to give you one. I did. I, I brought my book. I forgot my book uh, when I went to Ohio. I got my book today. Two truck drivers in opposite directions met in a narrow alley. Both drivers were stubborn, and neither of them wanted to reverse. They looked angrily at each other. Finally, one of them picked up a newspaper and started reading it. The other driver stuck his head out the window and politely said, when you finish with the paper, may I read it? <laughs> All right. If you have a copy of God's Word, open it up, if you will, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, verse number 16. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. Verse number 16. We do have a conference coming up the second weekend in November. It's uh, the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, It'll be there. Uh, If you go to the website, you can find a place. They've got rooms that are set up and blocked off. You can reserve um, up through October. You go to royalgracebc.com, Royal grace bible church bc.com and you can find the information there about the conference and there'll be some of the titles of the messages and the men will be coming will be up uh, a little later on all right second timothy chapter number three and i do thank brother richard and and uh shorewood for putting on this uh time that we can gather together grace school of the bible and get together and and be edified in the word of god and and get to uh Spend some time with one another, folks you hadn't seen in a while, uh, and, and meet them, and folks you had never met, you get to meet, and uh, it is good to be here. Second Timothy, chapter number three, before I start reading, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity now to open up your word and to share together in your word. I pray, Lord, the fellowship we have together for the next few moments, Lord, will be uh, edifying and, and be wonderful for us. Lord, may it... Uh, Bring honor, glory, and praise to you, and Lord, be profitable for us. May we leave knowing that it was a profitable time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The title that I was given uh, is It Requires a Bible You Can Trust. And folks, you can trust the Word of God. You have to have the Word of God according to what God says in uh, Psalms chapter number 12. And we'll get to that verse here in a little bit. But you can trust the King James Bible that you have for English-speaking people. I like the uh, verse of the song. That we just sang. I had. I was going to bring this up here, and we just sang it, so that was great. Uh, verse number five, and he just let us know. Brother Ted wrote that. The Bible stands in the King James Version. There, it's been preserved for me. God's word in English and without error. And my final authority. If you don't have an authority in your life, if you don't have that authority, you don't have the King James Bible. And if you have the King James Bible, you have the authority of God. The verse there says all Scripture. Scripture, inspiration, is God putting His Word into the vocabulary of men. And He does that by men writing down God's inspired Word. You've probably heard it said, I have, years ago, that inspired men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's not the men that were inspired. It's the Word that's inspired. It's God's Word that's inspired. And when when God's Word is put down on paper, it's then called Scripture. When you see the term Scripture in the Bible, 
It's referring to what God spoke. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in righteousness, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Look with me, if you will, Second Peter. Hold this whole Second Timothy. Look at Second Peter, just for a moment. Second Peter chapter number 1. Second Peter chapter number 1, look at verse number 20. If you go back and get all the way up through there, I mean, Peter is talking about the Word of God, this, what God spoke. He says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. And he goes up in there talking about the amount of transfiguration he, he heard there. Verse number 20, knowing this first, knowing, you need to know some things. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture, what God spoke, is of any private interpretation. Folks, do you realize there's not one Scripture in the Bible that you can take all by itself and use it to get a doctrine from? I mean, listen, you have to take all of God's Word. So many people try to take a verse here or a verse there. You can't interpret the Bible from one verse of Scripture. You have to have God's word, and then you have to have it rightly divided when you have it put together. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of a man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The holy men, the men didn't mean they were holy in themselves. It meant that they had set themselves up to obey God, to obey God's word, and to do what God wanted. And those men spoke as God inspired his word through them. They put it on paper, and you have the written word of God. Inspiration has to do with God giving his word and men writing it down. And I'm glad today that we have God's word in this King James Bible. Have you ever heard someone say the, the breathed word of God? God breathed. Um, Psalms chapter 33 verse 6 says this, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Look with me, if you will, at 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. First Timothy chapter number 5. <clears throat> when you get 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, hold that place. Get Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25. And then get Luke. Hold that place and get Luke. <laughs> chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10. All right. Reading 1 Timothy 5.18, first of all. 1 Timothy 5.18. For the Scripture saith, remember, what God says is called Scripture. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, Hold, hold this and look now to Deuteronomy, chapter number 25. Look at verse number 4. Here's where Paul quotes Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Thou shalt muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Paul quotes that. In the same verse, go to Luke chapter number 10. He quotes this as well. Luke 10, verse number 7. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking, such things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Now, if you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5, you'll see Paul takes a portion of Deuteronomy 25. And he takes Luke chapter number 10, the Old Testament. And he takes from the New Testament. I understand the 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is connected with the Old Testament. I understand you can't have a New Testament to the death of the testator. But notice he takes those passages from the Old Testament and when Christ walked upon the earth, what is uh, categorized as the New Testament, he calls both of them Scripture. Paul quotes them. He quotes a passage from the Old Testament, quotes a passage from the New Testament, and he says, verse 18, for the Scripture saith. He says those are the words of God. So you have God's Word in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're called Scripture. Whatever the Scripture says, God said it. And then you got man who comes along and he thinks he's going to improve on what God done. He's going to make it easier for you to understand. You ever heard that? <clears throat> They're so much easier to understand. I got a brother, a middle brother. All my family is in right division except my middle brother. I think he understands the truth of it. He just won't admit to it. But... Uh, he, he, he said, I like that new King James. These and the thou has been removed. And I showed him some of the, how important they are. And, you know, he kind of does his own little thing. But I think deep inside of his heart, he knows what's right and what's wrong. But you can't make anybody. You heard the old expression, you lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can do what you want to do, and you, you, you'll never make anybody do what they don't want to do. And if they do it, they have to be willing to do it. And if they're not willing to do it, if you get them to do it, it's no good. So, but, you know, these kind of people who say they're going to make God's Word easier for you to understand, they're just crippled a little bit too high for crutches. That's the nice way of saying it. I got some new versions here. I'm going to share a little bit with you. I wanted a New World Translation. I was trying my best to get one for a long time. I wound up with three copies before it was all over with. I even got a leather one. <laughs> Give to me. But I want to share a few things with you here in a little bit from those. Um, and I'll tell you, when they go to taking, when they go to trying to take, take God's Word and they try to make it easier, you know, you know what a Jehovah's Witness told me? This is the Scriptures for today. This is the what God's given for today. And I said, what about the folks before this thing ever come out? Oh, it wasn't for them. It's for us today. Needless to say, they don't come to my house anymore because I've been in conversation with them. I remember one Saturday, my wife and, and both of my daughters were there, my grandkids, and we were, I just cooked a big breakfast. I, we're from the South. We eat grits. It's kind of hard to find grits up here, you know. But... Uh, you can find them. But we, we, I just made some grits and liver mush and egg and I had fried some sausage. I mean, country eating. That kind they say clogs up your arteries, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All the house smelled good. Yeah. And we're, we finished eating. We're sitting around talking and get a knock on the door. Well, I go out and I walk out on the screen porch and this lady's there with two young kids, probably 12, 13 years of age, I guess. They come and we began to talk, and, and uh, she, had, she had a little book, and I said, excuse me, woman, I'll be right back. I didn't tell her what I was going to do. I run in and got my Bible. Well, when I come back out, and them girls were looking, and I said, I can tell y'all smelling food, aren't you? She, they, that one girl, she said, oh, it smells so good. <laughs> so, but it was all gone. I said, I'd give you some, but there's none left. And we talked. And I shared the Word of God with her. I had that woman in amazement. When she would say something, I would show her verses. And I had her to where she was, I believe, totally convinced what she was in was wrong. And those two girls were listening. Well, they left. I mean, people come by. You know how they are. They toot the horn, you know, trying to get them to come out of the house. And they're standing on the screen porch. And I kept them out there about 45 minutes to an hour. And finally, the people just began to blow the horn trying to get them out, get them out. And they left. And about three weeks later, the, that group was back out in the streets again. Well, there was a fellow with them I'd never seen. He must have come in from out of town to help out because he, he was white-headed, older, had him a real, real nice trim beard, real nice looking, uh, you know. And, and uh, they were out there and he pointed. He seen me standing on the porch and he done like that. And you, I seen three or four of them.
They didn't come back. And they hadn't been back since. They just avoid our house altogether. Folks, listen, you give the truth out there. You let it out there. It, it'll either help people or it'll run them. Uh, they'll, they'll want to stay far away from you. But, uh, you know, the truth, it will make you free. It made me free. Look at Hebrews chapter number 4. So what some folks don't understand is when you're dealing with the Word of God, you're dealing with God Himself. God's Word will tell of what character you are. Hebrews chapter number 4 verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's quick, comma, and powerful, comma, and sharper than any, any two-edged sword, comma, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. I like what Brother David said last night. Uh, we've been studying some of them on the body, the soul, and the spirit in our assembly. And uh, you do. Your, your body's a vehicle that carries that soul and spirit around on planet Earth. And one day they're going to both come out. And the body's going to go back to the dust. The spirit's going to go to God who gave it. And your soul is going to be somewhere eternally. You may lose it. What would a profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? God's Word even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now what's this? Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open, Unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God's word, folks, listen. You hear me. God has taken his word and made it equal to himself. When you're dealing with God's word, you're dealing with God. You know, these, this, these books are so important. These 66 books. God's word, the scripture is so important. And it's been here with man. Go to Revelation chapter number 20. God's word's so important that one day his word is going to be there in the judgment. And when these folks come along saying, oh, it means this and it means that. It didn't mean this and it didn't mean that. Well, they're going to have a rude awakening. You remember the verse we read a little bit ago in Peter? No scripture of any private interpretation. You can't just take one and make it what you want it to be. It takes the word of God to come together. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. You know when that time period is, right? You have We're in the dispensation of grace today. You have the seven-year uh, tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. After the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, then you have the white throne before the dispensation of the fullness of times. The white throne judgment is what we're talking about here. And him that sat on it, verse 11, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, or the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. You realize those 66 books that you hold are going to be in the judgment? You realize one day these books will be there? Men will begin to say, well, God, you, you know, your word said this, your word said that. They're going to begin to try to hold God accountable for their understanding of what his word said. But do you know that God's word has been said is forever settled in heaven and it'll be what God said even forever? Look at Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. Verse number 3. Romans 3, 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief 
make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, he's going to go back and quote Psalm 51, that thou mightest be justified in thy scriptures, in thy sayings. When God speaks and it's wrote down, it's scripture. That thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. God's going to be found righteous in his sayings, in his word. And mightest overcome when thou art judged. Folks, listen. There's going to be folks that's going to try to... They argue with you. You ever had people argue with you? That ain't what God's word means. That ain't what it means. And you know, they've got... Some people's got some high-fetched ideas about what God's word has to say. And some of them don't even have a clue, really, of what, what God's word does say. God will be justified in his word. He'll be justified in his sayings, folks. When the lost try to tell him what his word has to say. So, you... Uh, you, th- you think about that. And I, and I think about this song. I love this song. We sing this song quite a bit in our assembly. And it's called That Blessed Old Book. Y'all know that, don't you? I like verse number one. It says, It's a well of pure, uh, excuse me, It's a well of pure water when I'm thirsty and dry. Bread when I'm hungry and warm. When the battle is raging, it's my faithful sword, my shelter from life's troubled storm. It's a light to my pathway, a lamp to my feet. When the world gets so dark you can't see, and I've not made one change in one word that it says, but it sure made a change in me. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand is truth from beginning to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. Now it keeps me from sin. Great song. Psalms chapter number 12. Psalms chapter number 12. God's Word. Folks, you've got to have a book you can trust. If you don't have... If you just take everything in the world that people call Scripture, what you going to do? Because they don't all say the same. You got all kind of religions out there that claim what they got scripture. And it very well is what their God said. But you either serve Jehovah God or you serve a false God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead. You know, you're made up of flesh, blood, and bone. I'll give it to you more than one time probably. I give it to our assembly quite often. Every normal finger's got three joints. Represents God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You got three joints in your arm. You know, and I found out a while back when my daughter, she had an ulcer on her eye. She had to go to an eye specialist. I sat and asked that eye specialist. I said, I need to know one thing. I said, I've heard that you got to have three parts of the eye to see. I said, is that a true fact? He said, yes, sir. It's true. You got to have three parts. And I don't know if I can find it. I got it right in front of my Bible here. You got to have the cornea you got to have the nerve optic nerve you got to have the cornea the lens the optic nerve and the retina if you don't have all three of those you're blind you'll be blind you're gonna have all three of them to see in, in the whole world that you have you got animal life mineral life plant life what about in the high, in the heavens you have the sun the moon the stars that we use for light and i mean just thinking about those things you say that's not scripture no it's god's creation Read Romans 1.20 about the manifestation of the eternal Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost in creation. You know, I know that I'm where I ought to be. I know I'm serving the right God. I got the right book. And you got the Word of God. You got a book you can trust. Look at Psalms chapter number 12, verse number 6. Psalms 12, verse 6. The words with an S, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Listen, folks, you can can try silver. You can purify it seven times. You can purify it eight times. It's not going to get any bit more pure than it would if you had it seven times pure. God's word's pure. It's pure. You're not going to get it any pure. It's pure because that's the way God said it. 
The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The scripture of God is going to be preserved forever. It's forever settled in heaven. Look at Psalms chapter number uh, 119. Psalms 119. It's a great book. Psalms 119. It's a great psalm. You can read quite a bit in this book about the word of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse number 89. Forever. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse number 30. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Folks, God's word can give you some knowledge. It can give you some understanding. It can help you be what God wants you to be. When you allow God's word to be taken into your heart and into your life, it becomes a part of you, down in your soul. And God's word begins to grip you. You begin to understand that word, and then that word becomes a part of your everyday life. That's what God desires, and that's what God wants from you and I, is that Christ live in you. It's Christ in you, folks, the hope of glory. Amen. So, we need, we need God's Word. We have God's Word. We can trust God's Word. Did, did you, was you there at Psalms chapter number 12? Have you got too far away from it? Did you hold it? Did you turn away from it? You know how, you know how true God's Word is? <clears throat> I don't know if you ever read that next verse or not. He speaks about his word, verse 6 and 7. 7 says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Notice what he's preserved. Look at verse number 8. The wicked walk on every side, comma, when the vilest men are exalted. You can believe that. That's God's word. Believe it. That's the first point. I I keep looking for a clock. I don't see a clock. All right, go back to 2 Timothy. Let me move move to my second point. The second point is that once you have God's Word, you have to have it rightly divided. You ever heard these people say, God's Word's God's Word? You know, rightly divided. They got man. They got some weird ideas about how they rightly divide the word of truth too. You have been given some of them ideas by people. Once you know God's word, the only way to understand it, to get the profit out of it that God put in for you, you have to rightly divide it. Second Timothy chapter number two, verse number fifteen. If you go back to verses eleven to come down through there, you, you see how these people use God's word and they don't rightly divide it. He says in verse number four, fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to rightly divide God's word to get the profit out of it that God put in there for you. Now, I got an NIV here. You know what they do to that verse? You ever read an NIV in in, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15? Well, if you hadn't, let me read it for you. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Hmm. Let's see. Let me me try something. I I might better... Now, maybe I'm handling it right now. I won't get it dirty. Oh, excuse me. I'm handling it wrong. I got it upside down. Can you see how confusing that would be to somebody? You're going to correctly handle it. Am I doing a good job? You see, see how that would be so... And this one doesn't do it any better. This New World Translation, it doesn't help it any at all. So, I'll pull these off. 
it don't really matter. But I thought I might correctly handle it for you and, and demonstrate that to you. You can, you can have God's Word and you can not understand it if you don't rightly divide it. Do you know that Jesus Christ Himself rightly divided the Word? He knew when it was time for it to be put out. He knew when it was not time for it to be put out. Look with me, if you will, at the book of Luke, chapter number 4. When you find the book of Luke, get Isaiah 61. Luke, chapter number 4. And then get Isaiah 61. All right. Luke chapter number 4. Look with me, if you will, at verse number 21. Uh, go back up to verse uh, 19. Well, I better get at verse 18 if you're going to get it all. <laughs> verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. He read Isaiah 61, <coughs> excuse me, verse uh, chapter 61, and he got to that point, he says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. Hold your finger right here and look at Isaiah 61. Look where he stopped reading. Verse number 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where he stopped. He did not read, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all nations. He stops that thing because he's there. He's there to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He does not get into the vengeance because after he proclaims the acceptable year of the Lord, he's cut off. The vengeance doesn't come till over here. He leaves it so that the dispensation of grace can be put in here even though nobody knows about it at that particular time. He knew how to stop. And to rightly divide it because this time period comes after the dispensation of grace. He even stops there as he's uh, preaching to these people when he walked upon the face of the earth. So the new version Bibles, when you, when you get into these new version Bibles and then you get into this correctly handling stuff, boy, I tell you what, they make it totally impossible for you to take some of the passages that God gives you for rightly dividing the word of truth. They take them and they destroy them so you can't rightly divide them. Jesus Christ rightly divided. And I'm telling you today, friend, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. And if you don't, then you are not going to understand the truth. Now, <clears throat> you know, they get to that point in time where they go to questioning the Scriptures, just much like Satan did in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> you remember when Satan comes to Eve? He says, yeah, yeah, God said. He goes to questioning the goodness of God. He goes to questioning the grace of God. He, you may freely eat. The freely is left completely out of it when Eve goes to replying. And then he, he goes to saying, Ye shall not surely die. He just flat out denies the word of God. And that's exactly what they do in these new version Bibles. They just flat out deny the word of God. They flat out put it where you can't understand what God wants you to do. Get Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter number 16. You know, when I first began to see this truth 11 years, 10, 11, 12 years ago, I then lost track of how much time it was, I began to share some of this truth with my dad. My dad raised me in a Baptist church from the time I was just a kid. I just, I didn't know anything. I was raised in church. I was raised in the Baptist tradition. I knew all that stuff. 
And I tell you, my dad was sitting in the assembly, and it was so hard. Because every time I'd get through preaching on Sunday, and, and we always go eat Sunday dinner as a family together at my mom's house. She always cooks, still does. 76 years old, and she still cooks for the family. My dad's 81. And he, by the way, he's speaking for me this morning while I'm up here. And, uh, but we'd get home, and we'd go to eat dinner, and he'd say, Son, you said this this morning, and I tell you there's a scripture, and he'd be putting scriptures out. Because my dad was a Sunday school teacher for years. And he knows something about the Bible. But then I'd say, yeah, but Dan, what about this, this verses over here? And you know what? Most, most every time he'd say, oh, I've never seen that. And you know, today he, he's teaching people. I, he, my mom's had cancer. She's been to doctors. Every doctor they've ever been to, every nurse that's come in the room, as far as I know from his testimony and from the doctors that I've seen them with, he has told every one of them about the grace of God, about salvation by grace through faith. And then he starts telling them about Paul, about Paul's writings. And I don't know, I think they may sing the song up in this area. My dad wrote that song. He wrote a song about Paul. Uh, he sings that song all the time. But anyway, telling you, sometimes it may seem a little hard. If you're just starting... And you think in the back of your mind, there's another verse over here that, that, that counsels that out. I challenge you, study God's word. Make sure you check the avenues because right division is going to prove out perfectly every time. Amen. It will. Believe me. As a Baptist person years ago, I'm saved by God's grace. I'm, uh, I've been baptized into his death at the cross. Water had nothing to do with my salvation. It's got nothing to do with anybody else's salvation. Romans 16, 25. Notice what Paul says here. Now to him that is of power to establish you. Notice it doesn't say establish. You were established when you trusted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You were established. You were placed into him. But now what's going to make you stand firm when the wind blows? I mean, when, when people come throwing other doctrines at you or they throw verses at you and try to push you away from rightly dividing the word of truth, what's going to make you stand like you stuck in quicksand or like you stuck in concrete? Some of these big buildings that are erected and, and the concrete they have on them. Folks, what's going to keep you from being moved away? This passage right here tells you how God establishes you, how he makes you that way. Now, to him that is a power to establish you, According to my gospel, comma, number one, you've got to be saved by the gospel that the Apostle Paul puts out. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're listening to any other gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the everlasting gospel. There's more than one gospel in the Bible, by the way. And if you're listening to some other gospel, you're not listening to the right gospel. It has to be the gospel according to Paul for the dispensation of the grace of God. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, comma, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, not according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but according to the revelation of the mystery. The mystery that was given to Paul, the mystery of Christ. It's the mystery of Christ that was given to Paul. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. It's made manifest through the preaching of the Apostle Paul, Romans through Philemon, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. The prophets all prophesied about Israel's program. Prophecy, it's been prophesied. The 70th week of Daniel's prophesied. Prophecy. This, my friend, is the mystery of Christ. It's the dispensation of grace. And if we, you understand God's word according to salvation by Paul's gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and prophecy, you can understand rightly dividing the word of truth. You can be established. Nobody can push you away from the truth of this book. And if you don't get established there and you don't get established in rightly dividing, you can be moved away. Don't mean you're not saved. 
that's going to mean your truth in your head and according to God's words is not going to match up. It's not going to come together. Notice. You know what this book says here? You notice I didn't call it a Bible. You know what this, this, this book says here in Romans 16, 25? Let me read it to you. New Version Bible? You can't get what I just give you out of the King James from this book. Now to him who is able to establish. See, they got an E on the front of it. Now to him that is uh, able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings. No, what Paul gave wasn't made known through the prophetic writings, was it? What about this one? This is the New World Translation. Now to him who can make you firm in accord with the good news, I declare in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the revealed secret or the sacred secret, which has been kept in silence for long lasting times, but now has been made manifest and has been made known through the prophetic scriptures among all nations. You see, the New World Translation destroys rightly dividing the word of truth as well. And I mean, you can just go on and on. Go to the next one. I got to hurry. He just told me I had a few minutes left. I'm glad he done that. I don't have to pull my clock out and look. Colossians chapter 2. Look at Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter number 2. Look with me, if you will, at... Just read verse 1. This is a good passage. You ought to understand this passage. I don't have time to preach it, but I'll, I'll share a little with you. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and of them and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. you never seen Paul's face in the flesh, so this is good for you. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. You want the riches, all riches, and the full assurance of understanding? To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge God's put in this book for you? Understand the mystery of God. The mystery of God is the nation of Israel come to fruition and all things coming together. It's all about Israel's program. The mystery of Christ is what Paul gives, the dispensation of the grace of God. And the mystery of Father is Paul's mystery and the prophetic writings all coming together in the heaven and in the earth in eternity. That's the three mysteries that's mentioned there. You can study those things out for yourself. Now, you know what they have to say about it? You want to hear Colossians 2 according to this thing? I just called it a thing. <laughs> Colossians 2, I'll read verse number 2. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Left, the God, left God and the Father plumb out. Didn't even mention God and the Father. And this one here is just as bad. Colossians 2. It says that their hearts may be comforted, that they may be harmoniously joined together in love, and with a view to all the riches of the full assurance of their understanding, with a view to the accurate knowledge of the sacred secret of God, namely Christ. See, you need God's Word. You need the King James Bible so you understand what God's done for you. And go to Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2. And I'll close with this just so I know I'm doing good. All right. I'm in, I'm in uh, Ephesians. That won't work. 
Maybe I might need to close with that. Galatians chapter number one, chapter number two, excuse me. Verse number, mm, verse number seven. But contrawise, like I go back to verse six. I was going to go there. But of these who seem to be somewhat, you know, there's some people who seem to be something. You know that? You get in a conversation with three or four people, boy, they think they're something. They think they got it. They know it. And you ain't putting nothing over on them. And they got degrees. And you go to talking to them. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it making no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. For they who seemed to be something or somewhat in comforts added nothing to me. See, Paul, you're talking about somebody with degrees. Paul had them. Pharisee of the Pharisee. I mean, listen. Boy, he, he knew it. He, he had it. Uh, speaking of the law, blameless. He had, he had credentials, but those things he counted lost for Christ. None of, the, none of those people could add anything to him, but he had something they didn't know about, the dispensation of grace, that they didn't know about that he added to them. Verse 7, but contrawise, when they saw that the gospel... What's that next word? I mean, you need to make sure you see that and you need to not ever let anybody change that. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Notice that. Look at this. Boy, I tell you, you, you know what this one does, don't you? You like to hear what this thing says? You probably don't want to hear it, but I'm going to give it to you. I want to share it with you. I can find it. Galatians chapter number 2. It says, As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been given the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been given the task of preaching the gospel to the Jews. It's not what your King James Bible says. It don't say to, it says of. The gospel of the circumcision and, and the New World Translation is just as bad. It does, it does just as much damage as this one. Never let anybody change that. Look at those verses again. Make sure you note that. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go into the heathen and they into the circumcision. You know, that baffles my mind when I read that. Maybe you didn't catch it just reading over it. I put some study into that thing and I went back and I was calculating and looking. And folks, the best I can come up with by the scriptures, you're talking about, I know 17 years of Paul's message, of Paul working in here, Probably 18 years plus, it takes Peter, James, and John to finally perceive, oh, that's what you're talking about. (laughs) Religious people sometimes don't get it when they understand their doctrine. They were given their truth. Peter knew the truth. He knew what he was given. It took him 18 plus years to wake up to what God gave Paul. When I read that verse, that's what I get. When I read these verses, that's what I get out of it. Verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go into the heathen and they unto the circumcision. 18 years. Do let, do let me close with Ephesians 1. Go there. And people read this or Ephesians 3. People read this verse and they get all kind of confused in their little brain about 
what this verse says. David covered this very well last night. I'm just going to point one thing out to you. Look in verse number uh, 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. I'm in Ephesians 3, verse 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Folks, that's the same passage you find in Galatians 2. When they finally perceive and they wake up, that's Acts 15, when the meeting goes on up there at Jerusalem and they finally understand what Paul's got going on down there. Don't let somebody throw you on that verse, that it was revealed to the apostles and uh, you know, get all that stuff together at one time. Let, don't let somebody confuse you. And I challenge you, you got God's Word, study on it. And as David said last night, maybe you're here. Maybe you've never been saved by God's grace. Maybe you think it's something you have to do. Folks, the only thing you have to do is believe the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. Believe that Christ died for your sins. Believe that he was buried. And believe that he rose again the third day. Put your faith and trust in him and him alone for your eternal salvation. And the moment you do that, thank God God circumcises you. He regenerates your dead spirit. Gives you the spirit of God so you can understand the things of God. He indwells you by the Holy Spirit of God. He baptizes you into the death of Christ and makes you a member of the body of Christ. And he seals you with God the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. What a blessing it is to know that when God saves you, he does it right. Trust him. Trust the book. Study it. Learn it. Thank you, Lord, for this time we've had together to study your word with the saints. In Jesus' name, amen.